about things like if we do talk about things like taxes or investing, um, I just include this page as a reminder that um, you're ultimately responsible for your own uh, financial lives, and and I'm I'm just kind of here to teach and to entertain, and and that um, you know please don't sue me if anything doesn't work out for you. So I'm gonna I think it's hard to have a conversation about money without really talking about some of the some of the the uh, legacy issues and, and inequality that that uh, comes along with money. So we're going to just get, talk about that a little bit right off Jump Street, and then we'll we'll get into those things that you know we have more control over, like our spending, emergency funds. Uh, number four, dealing with uh, debt and understanding debt. Number five, talking about credit, and number six, you know, kind of your purchasing habits. And then uh, just because it's become such a such an area of interest the last couple of years, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about cryptocurrency. So as I mentioned, I, I was doing a little bit of research today just to make sure I, I had my facts straight. And uh, the, the, uh, the single biggest driver of wealth for the vast, vast majority of American households is their home equity, the value, the value of their home minus the mortgage. And uh, a scant 12 years before I was born, the federal government uh, stopped the practice of um, discriminating against black and brown communities when it comes to uh, underwriting their, their mortgages. The, the practice, some of you might be familiar with the concept of redlining. And so it was, it was less than 50 years ago that the, the, literally the federal government through the, the GSE, the, the government sponsored uh, entities, Fr Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, were making it very, very difficult for those types of communities to access the wealth that only comes with home ownership. And so, and the, this, this kind of screen grab is from Fox News, not exactly a bastion of progressive thought. And even they are willing to share this uh, this extreme uh, delta when it comes to the racial wealth gap. And so I think uh, in, our, in our culture and our society, we oftentimes um, look at money as a way that we keep score personally as a reflection of our own talent, contributions, hard work, brains, whatever you want to call it. But the reality of the matter is that um, statistically, not, not everyone is on equal footing. And, and so I, I share this with all of you because I want you to just, I really want all of us to try and separate our, our, net, our net worth from our, from our feelings of net worth, right? Our, our self-esteem. And, and that isn't just a fact underrepresented people, but it also affects women uh, where we, we, see, um, we, see, uh, we see a workplace that statistically um, punishes or taxes, whatever you want to call it, uh, mothers. Uh, that there, there's a expectation. There's, there's uh, structural issues in the workplace in the United States. This, uh, the graph on the right is from Vox, V-O-X, not F-O-X, V as in Victor, where it talks about how uh, women and men actually enjoy a, a fair amount of uh, gender or parity when it comes to pay until right before a, a woman. Uh, uh, decides uh, or, or has a child, and uh, and then the the uh, bottom line headline is that it's estimated that eight men control control more wealth than the bottom half of the global population. So eight human beings on planet Earth, I think all men of European ancestry uh, control more than three point eight or whatever the number is these days billion people. So. Uh, I say I say all this to just you know again reinforce my my main point, which is you know you you shouldn't tie your self esteem to your money, right? Uh, your 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 financial situation. In a lot of ways, it's it's um it's not always it's it's sometimes it's a roll of the dice that's beyond of our control. So let's now that we've uh, gotten that out of the way, I think we you know a lot of people want wealth, they aspire to wealth, they, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly something that's 
uh, thought about a lot in our culture and in, in, in the content that we see around us. And uh, any numerical uh, any numerical definition of wealth is arbitrary, right? One hundred thousand dollars, six figures, a million dollars, a billion. Uh, this is the best definition of wealth I've ever found in my life. That you're wealthy if your passive income is greater than your cash burn, right? The amount of money that the the assets that you own and the amount of money that they generate exceeds the amount of money that it costs for you to live your life. And I just I just think this is such a great definition. Uh, there's really only two ways to get rich quickly, and one involves knowing tomorrow's winning lottery numbers, and the other involves being born into the right family. Uh, no matter who you are, just about every other way of getting rich generally takes a lot of time and effort, right? It takes a lot of time to, to build investments and assets that help you secure your retirement. It takes a lot of time to build assets that generate rents, a real estate portfolio. And the way that um, assets and interest and investment returns work in the Western world is that over time, the, the, those investments compound and grow. And so more often than not, older people are worth or have a much larger accumulated wealth than younger people. Um, and so um, the, the, this is a game, this is, uh, this is a process that requires an immense amount of patience. Uh, and so uh, if I wanna put, if this was a, um, a book a for dummies book, I'd put a little red flag here and that little red flag would say, if it if it's if it seems too good to be true, it is, and and there's no so, there's no shortcuts, you know. So if any time in your life you're ever presented with an uh, an economic opportunity that seems too good to be true, it probably is. So I've got a question here at the bottom. What do you think is more determinant of wealth accumulation, your income or your savings rate? So I'll let if anybody has a once they hazard a guess, I'll let them let them put it out there. Anybody drop it in the chat or just speak up. No one. Okay. Oh, wait, there's one in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Savings rate, your ability to save, right? There's a lot of people in this world that make you know, two hundred thousand dollars a year and spend two hundred and ten, uh, and uh, and so you know, living paycheck to paycheck is not just for uh, people with modest modest incomes. Your your savings rate, your bill, your propensity and ability to save is is much more determinant of your ability to accumulate wealth than than uh, how how much money you make. Making a lot of money certainly makes it easier sometimes. So th this this whole this whole um, conversation this this uh, this this seminar that I'd like to share with you today it's all about feeling empowered to take control of your finances and um, when I started teaching personal finance about four or five years ago one of the first things that I would always do with my classes is I'd I'd give them a template which I'm happy to give any of you that would like it I'll send it to Nick uh, after after this after this session. And much like if any of you, you, some of you might have done this before with uh, food or diet or, or maybe uh, exercise, but you're just keeping a daily spending diary. It's, you know, you can keep it a notebook, Excel file, whatever, whatever is easiest and convenient for you, but you're simply writing down uh, the purchases you make throughout the course of a day. And then um, you'll also add an analysis, you know, if you have, if, if there are monthly or, or, or uh, uh, expenses like utility or rent or, or a car note or, or perhaps uh, you know, biannual like car insurance or something along those lines, you're, you're gonna spread out and include those costs as well. And it, it's, it's, it's really, um, I did it, you know, there was, I probably, there was probably a year or two that went by before I did it myself, which uh, you know, kind of do as I do, not as I say, or do as I say, not as I do, right? Uh, but then one year I did it 
it, and it, my goodness, it changed, it changed the way I think I thought about, you know, we're, we're all really bad at uh, the, the mental accounting of keeping track of things. Right. And, and nowadays no one, no one balances checkbooks like they did um, when I was a kid uh, because you don't have to, you know, your the money kind of flows so quickly in and out of a checking account. You don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that anymore. But if you start to, if you keep the spending diary for a month, ideally you keep it for three, it will, I promise you, you will, you will have more money over the course of the next 90 days than you would if you don't do this because it gamifies savings. You know, you'll feel, you'll feel the pain of paying for things that you might forget about or using a credit card. Sometimes it kind of tricks our mind into forgetting that behind that credit card is, you know, actual cash. Right. So it's going to, it's going to, it's just, it's just, this is going to change your life. You know, if you, if you don't do anything else, this is, this is just such a great thing to do. You're going to identify any old subscriptions or wasteful spending. You know, if somebody's, you might even identify fraud if you're unlucky or lucky. Right. But most importantly, keeping the spending diary is going to give you a very deep understanding of how much money you need to save for your emergency fund, you know, kind of how much money your life costs. A lot of us talk about budgets, making budgets. Everybody tells you to make a budget. What is that? If you don't have a good sense of how much your life costs in the first place, how are you ever going to expect to make a budget, right? You can walk into a room with 100 people and at least 95 of them will have a really good idea of how much money they're going to make, or how much money they made in the last 12 months, right? But if you walk into a room and you ask 100 people how much their life costs the last 12 months, they probably have no clue. And I see that as deeply problematic because the, the, real, the real thing that, ma- the actual thing that matters is how much your life costs, not how much money you make. If you, if you make, you know, understanding how much money your life costs is the first step towards answering all the other questions about emergency, emergency fund, retirement, things of that nature. And it's certainly, these things change over time, right? Our, uh, we switch jobs. We, 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 we gain or lose a, a spouse. We have a child. Uh, we age, right? We have to pay for things like college or, or healthcare or things of that nature. Uh, de- your, your parents might become uh, dependents someday. But you know, in the short run, this is still an incredibly powerful tool to help you really grab control of your, of your financial life. Um, so, you know, when you, we put them together, it's a pretty easy process. You can uh, look at all of your bank statements, your credit card accounts. Don't forget all of the new financial technology apps, Cash App, Venmo, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, so many streaming services today, so many subscriptions. Uh, the tech companies go out of their way. They go out of their way to make taking money from you as hidden and painless and inconsequential as they can. And they also make it incredibly hard for you to turn off those annuities, right? Tech companies love recurring revenue and they love it when you sign up for subscriptions and they love it even more when you stop using those subscriptions but still keep paying, right? So there's a lot of opportunity for you to use the um, spending diary to start to, to find and, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, eight bucks a month, you know, 15 bucks a month, $60 a month, whatever it is. Well, you know, eight bucks a month is a hundred bucks a year, right? If I saw, if I saw a hundred bucks sitting on the sidewalk, I'd pick it up and be glad, you know, probably be one of the luckier things that would happen to me throughout the course of the day, right? So make sure to check out all of your, all of the technology, uh, all of the, um, see if you can find the subscriptions, See if, uh, make sure do you include the Cash App and the Venmos when you're looking for your spending. And then, you know, spread your fixed costs, like your, your car insurance, your, your, your rent, your utilities, uh, th- uh, spend of that nature over the corresponding number of days in the month, right? So, you know, set aside a few minutes of day to, to just update it. It won't take you very long once you get in a good habit. And, and like I said, do it for 90 days you'll be able to extrapolate that over the course of a full year. 90 days is roughly one quarter of a year, give or take. Three months, 90 days, whatever whatever you can commit to. 
And if any of you would like a blank template um, to use, uh, you just email me at matthew.rolling at wayne.edu and I'm happy to happy to send you one. All right, I'll do a little check in here. Any uh, any questions? No. I think there's a definitely an interest in that template. We'll get it. We'll definitely get it to you. It's a it's a it's it's a great one. It's it'll 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 be a good one. You know. <laughs> it's, awesome. Uh, okay. So um, every single financial guru, you know, and I know all of you are in school right now, and it's I know building in school you're 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 investing a lot in your future earning potential right you're you have you're you're in grad school you are you are borrowing money right a lot of you are 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 um going into debt in order to fund your education and that's that's laudable you know you're 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 thinking about your future and making strategic investments in your future uh and so the idea of you know invest you know emergency funds and retirement might seem like um, uh, a luxury, right? Uh, but um, I, I, I want to still impress upon all of you why they're important and give you uh, a little encouragement to at least try and start making it a habit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, dwelling on all of the um, curveballs and uh, the potholes, whatever metaphor you're looking for that life throws at you. I'm sure everyone on this sem uh, on this Zoom right now has had at least several of these. I know I've had, I think I, I think at least, I think every single thing on this list has happened to me personally. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, the if, if nothing else, uh, having some money set aside uh, so that you can weather these shocks is is so critical, and, and uh, e even if it's a you know it's a, a portion of aid or that you can you know kind of uh, set aside to help you you know whether a, if it's a if it's a purchasing a new cell phone or a new muffler or you know whatever the case might be in order to keep your life uh, uh, moving uh, in spite of uh, these types of uh, minor events, an emergency fund is is so critical. And it, and it should be very liquid, liquid meaning whatever you're putting it in, it's easy to convert into cash quickly and without losing principal. So you're not putting it in Dogecoin or, uh, or uh, sneakers or rare art or fine wine. Uh, and it, it should be, um, uh, it should be you know, very accessible. So once you've used your spending diary to get a, to kind of dial in what a month in the life costs for you, right? Let's just pretend for the sake of argument that your life costs, you know, 20, let's say $2,000 a month for your food, rent, insurance, you know, subscriptions, clothes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, a, th a, a three month emergency fund for someone whose life costs two grand a month would be about 6,000 bucks, right? Um, I think that the, uh, size of the emergency fund should be determined by the 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 risk, the downside risk of the life of the life. Uh, and so, what I mean by that is, if you're a single parent with three kids, uh, the 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 criticality of having an emergency fund is even more important than if you're a single person with no kids, right? Uh, if and uh, and the odds of you losing the job, right? So if you are, if you work for the state of Michigan and you're, you know, and you have a collective bargaining unit, and it would take an act of Congress literally to lose your job, you know, you probably you might not need six six to nine months of emergency fund, right? But if you're maybe a real estate agent or an insurance salesperson or working at a startup, um, you know, where where the odds of you losing your job might be. Uh, more likely, then you know you should you should try and set aside uh, more money. Um, you know, if I said to you, um, "Hey, you should really try to save two thousand uh, bucks," you'd say, "Hey, that's really hard. Uh, thanks for not having, you know, empathy for me being a grad student. Weren't you a grad student once upon a time?" And I'd say, "Okay, fair enough." I said, "Well, can you save five dollars a day?" 
And you say, yeah, you know, I could probably, you know, five bucks a day is pretty doable, right? This is the whole eating the elephant one bite at a time. And so, well, if, if every single person uh, here uh, could set aside five bucks a day for the next 365 days, in a year from now, you'd have 1800 bucks, right? So, um, you know, again, uh, creating tools to help uh, one way or the other with, with, you know, with, with, with any luck, you will be a year old or a year from now. So why not have an extra 1800 bucks, right? So, um, you know, these, it takes patience and time to build these tools. And so I don't want any of you to, 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 to walk away from this Zoom uh, feeling overwhelmed or uh, insecure that you don't have it all figured out. I want you to walk away feeling confident that you can plan that you can implement these tools and uh, put plans in place that give you the confidence and space to pursue these. Okay, so um, sometimes uh, debt is a four letter word, right? And debt can be, um, you know, debt can be the death of a thousand cuts or it can be uh, a, a magical tool that helps you accomplish your life goals, right? Uh, student loan debt, mortgage debt, uh, generally low interest, sometimes tax deductible, usually used to buy things that uh, generate long-term value for us and prosperity, right? Credit card debt, you know, uh, um, Auto, automotive loan debt, I'll throw that in there. I'm not a big fan of borrowing money to buy cars if you, unless you have to. Um, you know, rent a center type debt, payday loan debt, payday loan debt. Ugh. 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 Nope. You know, these, these are the types of debt instruments that can really um, prevent, that, that can really put you in a hole quickly. Um, that's, that, and 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 the sh and the shame of it is, you know, you're you're freshman in college, and there are uh, people giving you T-shirts and tables everywhere, trying to get you to sign up for Capital One, this Discover Card, that, uh, because they want to get their hooks in you, right? Uh, credit cards, you know, I think the average, I think the average, I'm I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'll still share it because I, I think I might be, I think the average household in the United States has $6,000 in credit card debt, but there's a lot of households that don't have any. So I think households that carry a balance have 14,000 on average. That's probably gone down though, because I know with the last year and a half with all the stimulus that a lot of and the savings rates have gone up since the pandemic and credit card balances have gone down. So it's probably not that bad anymore, but it's still, my, my point being that a lot of a lot of people in the United States struggle with this. The, you know, again, this is about helping you take control and giving you a plan. This spreadsheet right here, if you were to work with a debt consolidation company, it's basically the same math that they would use to try and wrap up your, your loans and, and either negotiate with your, with your <coughs> lenders or to try and help you get things tidied up and turned into one payment, right? You can, you can start to do this yourself. You can create this table at the left in Excel. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily going to send this one out. It's, 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 I think it's fairly straightforward. I can, of course, I can, you know, if any of you want, want, uh, want this, I'm happy to send it to you, but, um, and you, you know, I like to line it up. Who do you owe the money to? I know it says credit card here, but you know it could be, um, you know, Home Depot or furniture, or you know, it could be appliances or furniture or something else, right? You know, you can borrow money to buy just about anything these days. Um, so, who do you owe money to? What's the capacity or the limit of the card? That's an important part of the puzzle, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. How much do you owe them? What's the percentage of the balance outstanding? And then what's the interest rate, right? The, some people like the, the psychological benefit 
of knocking off the little guy first, right? So the 400 in this example, the $450 to Forever 21, some people might say, hey, you know, even though that's the lowest interest rate, I'm gonna pay that off first just to kind of give me some momentum. If that works for you, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Mathematically, the best approach is to work your way down from the card or the balance that has the highest interest rate and go down from there because you're, you're paying more for that card. You're paying more for that loan. And so the, the faster that you can take out that visa at the 20% interest rate, the fast you'll have, you'll unlock additional money because now you won't have a, 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 a tranche of your debt won't be at 20%, it'll be at 16, right? So right off the bat, you'll have a little more capacity to start to burn down that Discover card and then the Forever 21, and then you're out of the woods, right? So my, my, my preferred approach is to start with the, the debts that have the highest interest rate and work your way down. You know, and you can use a similar approach with your student loans. Um, if you have private student loans, they might carry a higher interest rate than um, the federal loans. And, and so you might have, uh, you know, significant amounts of money that, that might, you might want to tackle. Um, if interest rates are, if your interest rates on debt is very low, um, you know, let's say your interest rate on a federal student loan was 3%, three and a half percent. I'm not really sure what the market is these days. You know, that's, that's a, that's an amount that's not going to place a significant uh, 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 bottleneck on your ability to really grow wealth. Um, it's okay to, to kind of slow walk or to just make the minimum payments on loan where the interest rates start to get into the low single digits. Any, uh, any questions? Your comments, Nick? No. Everyone's looking. Everyone's following along. Okay. Yeah, nothing. Nothing new. Just some uh, some good little comments, but uh, no questions yet. Okay. So uh, you're. Um, I'm not exactly familiar how. Uh, no, I don't know exactly how familiar all of you are with uh, FICO scores, but the um, there are three credit bureaus that operate in the United States. Um, TransUnion, Equifax, and, um, oh shoot, I'm having a brain cloud fog. TransUnion, Equifax, and I can't remember the third one. But these, uh, these companies will uh, collect reams and reams and reams and reams of data, tens and, tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of terabytes of data every day about everything that we do uh, that's linked to our social security number um, and, and it's related to our, to our, to the borrowings that we have, right? The, the, uh, the credit, the credit transactions we have. And there's some, um, this is incredibly important. Companies are allowed to, uh, companies can not hire you and say that it's because you have a bad credit score. Uh, cell phone carriers can not you know, loan you money for a cell phone or not allow you to sign up for a plan because you have bad credit. Utilities can turn off your power or deny you the right to you access to service for bad credit, right? And, and we're not, we haven't even touched on how expensive life can be if you want to borrow money uh, if you have poor credit. So is it is it a perfect system? No, absolutely not. Does it... Um, is it is it kind of a black black box sometimes? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is does it is it important and does it have a lot of impact of your life if you want to live a kind of normalish mainstream United States life? Yes, it's it's incredibly important. Um, and so all of you, I, I'm you know I use Credit Karma, Credit Sesame. There's a lot of really great products out there these days that you know you can use to to keep an eye on your credit. It's, it's worth uh, taking a look at the, the report, the report, which is kind of the documentation of all of the things <coughs> that, that you, know, you know, Matt Rowling had a loan with um, uh, Visa uh, and, it, and it was as high as $15,000, but now it's zero and he always paid it on time. And right now that card is uh, not active, right? So the credit report will walk through the details of your lending history. The credit score 
is the three digit number that the companies spit out that uh, is used to uh, uh, by the rest of the world to kind of uh, evaluate your, your, your credit worthiness, right? So uh, what, what impacts your FICO score? The blue section, the, the payment history, there, there's, there's no substitute for paying your bills on time over time. And, and so, you know, if you have to sign up for auto pay, if you have to, you know, put a reminder in your calendar, if you have to tell your spouse or roommate to, you know, punch you in the shoulder every time March, every time the 15th rolls around, whatever you need to do, you know, make sure you do it to make sure that that bill is being paid on time. Um, never, never too, never too late to, to start a new habit, a new, new financial hygiene, so you can stay on top of these things. Um, and, and because of the time element, it's a lot easier for a 40 year old to have good credit than a 20 year old, right? Um, amounts owed, amounts owed is, if you, if you remember this page, we're gonna come back to uh, the credit card example. Uh, these percentages here, the percentage column, when you start to, when you start to climb over 30, 35%, in your capacity to borrow on revolving or, or consumer credit, the credit companies start to get nervous. And, uh, and so, you know, they will, they will assume that you're starting to tap your credit cards or your revolving credit because you're, uh, you have some type of growing or, or financial duress and that you're, you borrowing are eating up your capacity to borrow is a sign of trouble. And so if your capacity, the amount you owe on uh, your credit cards in aggregate starts to climb, it will start to severely impact your credit. That's the bad news. The good news is that it's the easiest, I shouldn't say it's the easiest, it's the fastest way to improve your credit score. And so if you have, uh, if you have uh, eaten up a lot of the capacity of your cards, if you make it a priority and, and to, to knock it down back underneath that 30% threshold, it's the fastest way to improve your credit score. There's no other, you know, no, no other, nothing that else comes even close. So um, types of credit, you know, the, the new credit inquiries, the credit history, all of those uh, elements take, take kind of a, a back seat to the two biggies, which is paying your bills on time and the amounts owed. One, one tip I have for everyone listening, and I've done this, uh, I used to do this a lot when I was uh, younger and had credit card trouble, but I would um, spend, if I thought that I was gonna be late on a payment or I thought that my credit card interest rate was too high, I would call them up and I would say, hey, you know, uh, I think my payment's gonna be a couple days late uh, please don't report it to the bureau. And nine times out of 10, they wouldn't uh, because the credit card companies aren't interested in hurting your credit. They're interested in you paying them money. And so you have a lot of, you have a lot of room to work with them on sometimes even, you know, if, if I think the average interest rate on a credit card in the U.S. is about 15, 16%. So if you have cards with rates uh, north of that, you know, 18, 20, 22, 24, you can reach out to them you can call them and it might take some patience, definitely take some courage, a little chutzpah, but you can talk to them and you can say, hey, look, you know, I, I see that you're, um, you know, you're charging me 20% on this card. My understanding is that's a little high, you know, can you work with me here? And you might not think that you have any leverage, but you could always threaten to cancel the card and use a balance transfer to move the amount outstanding. And that's the last thing that they want to hear. So, you know, you do have some ability to, to work with uh, consumer credit companies to, uh, to try and make things better for you. Okay, so I um, wanted to talk, you know, this page is I think an important one. I, I'm not a monk. You know, I'm not a martyr, I'm not a sadist, whatever the right, uh, you know, so if any of you are masters in literature or theology, you can help me with my words here. 
Um, you know, the whole point of having money is to help you enjoy your life on your terms. And so I'm not going to tell you, you can't go to Starbucks or you can't buy jeans or you can't go on vacation. That's, that's why we have money is to, to do fun stuff like that. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want things to become habitual. You know, if you're, if you have a $8 a day Starbucks habit from Monday through Friday, that's 400 times 52, that's a $2,000 a year habit. So maybe Starbucks every day it should be replaced with Starbucks Wednesdays, which is only a uh, eight times 52, $400 habit, a year habit. So there's, you know, you don't want to have Starbucks every day maybe, but, um, but no, I, I think the occasional splurges uh, aren't what, uh, what will stop you, you know, from, uh, from, from really building wealth. Uh, the, the, the biggest, uh, as I mentioned at, you know, kind of the beginning of this presentation, the biggest driver of accumulated wealth for most Americans is home equity. Uh, now, the home, the housing market is, is dealing with a lot of interesting factors right now. And, and so home equity is even harder to access now than it was, you know, a year or two ago. Uh, but, um, but once you get past home equity, uh, the biggest driver of wealth for the, the wealthiest households in the United States of America is uh, equity in companies. And so their ownership stakes in either private businesses or public companies uh, through investments in stocks. Um, so again, I really want to reiterate, no one likes to get rich slow, but it's the only way to do it. Um, and so I think the, uh, the things that really hold back wealth accumulation are, you know, buying things, buying expensive assets that don't depreciate, right? Boats, snowmobiles, motorcycles. I'll also put um, things like uh, diamonds, uh, you know, if, if you if you ever diamonds, uh, the retail versus the wholesale or trade in on diamonds is it's ridiculous. The margins are insane and you never you'll never dream of recouping your money. They don't go up in value. Um, you know, buying assets that buying investing significant amounts of money and assets that and diamonds, I know engagement rings, we have a lot of we have a new tradition about engagement rings. It's only about 100 years old. You know, nobody bought an engagement rings in the 19th century. Diamond engagement rings is the the beers cartel that convinced us we needed them. So I know half of you, a lot of you are probably really upset at me for, for saying that right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, investing in assets that pay you, you know, bonds pay you interest, real estate pays you rents, stocks pay you dividends. Those are the assets that really help you accumulate wealth. And um, there are, you know, if you, if you, I'm not saying you shouldn't ride snowmobiles or, 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 or use boats, but you can rent those and you can let somebody else worry about depreciation and gas and insurance, right? You, so I'm certainly not suggesting you can't do all the things you wanna do. I just think there's a way to do it that doesn't really hold back your, your balance sheet, your, your, your net accumulated wealth. So for instance, I like this example. It kind of danced around the internet the last year or two, you know, I, I'm, Going to get the math kind of right, but you know, if three years ago you'd bought, you you could have bought a Tesla Model S for eighty five thousand dollars, or you could have bought eighty five thousand dollars in Tesla stock. I think that stock is probably worth about one million, one point one million dollars today. And so, you know, this is the Tesla Model S is not worth eighty five grand, that's for sure. Uh, so, you know, this is just kind of a, a a more salient example I can share with you to help you realize the difference between a depreciating asset and an appreciating asset, right? Sadly, you can't, uh, you can't drive your Tesla stock around the neighborhood and brag to your friends, uh, but that's kind of my point. I'd much rather have $1.1 million in the bank account than a really, really cool car that's losing value every day sitting in my driveway. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about cryptocurrency, which, um, you know, there's kind of very strong opinions, right? You know, some people, it's a fad, I don't understand it, it's really speculative and volatile, you'll, you'll lose your money, right? 
There's people that'll saying it's transformative, it's the future of the economy, you're, you're missing the boat and fortunes will be made or lost. And so it's, it's kind of hard to separate the, the fact from the fiction, you know? And so I'm gonna try to share some objective things about it to help you better understand it. For starters, you know, it's not a currency. A currency it, definitionally is uh, a store of value uh, a means of exchange and a way for us to measure things. And so uh, cryptocurrency is not, we don't really use it to exchange things. We don't, we don't use it to trade. We don't really use it to measure, right? We, we look at Bitcoin and we say it's $46,000. We don't look at the Tesla and say it's two Bitcoins. And so it's not a currency. Um, it's also very lightly regulated, right? Um, if I have $50,000 in my bank and the bank fails, the federal depositors insurance company will uh, reimburse me, right? If I invest in the stock market, uh, my, you know, I might lose things, but there are, but those, those companies are extremely well regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission and, and FINRA. And, uh, and so there are, there are a lot of, there's a, there's a hundred year old uh, legacy legal system to help uh, ensure that you know they're to kind of weed out the the fraudsters and to keep the the uh, fly by nighters and the con con men and flim flam people at bay, right? Cryptocurrency is the wild wild west. It's really easy to you know to spin up a new currency and to take somebody for all they're worth. It's it's still not that easy to invest in. And cryptocurrency doesn't make you any money. Yeah, I know, you know, for some of you people that, are, for anyone that's really into it, there are some instances where you can uh, stake your currency and, and generate some interest, uh, but uh, that's not the norm. So that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that it's ridiculously interesting. It's totally fascinating. Uh, the blockchain has so much potential to uh, change change the way we think about the world and, and change the way we solve problems. A lot of people are starting to use cryptocurrency and well-diversified portfolios as kind of an inflation hedge, much the same way gold has been used historically. And it's here to stay. Uh, you know, it's, it seems, in my opinion, we're still, we're, it's, we're still waiting for the killer app, right? And, you know, so we had internet you know, the internet was around for a long time before people really, you know, I think, I think it was invented in the seventies. And then it was in the, you know, in the early mid nineties when email, and I think you could probably call it email and search, maybe search browsers <coughs> like Netscape, AOL, you know, there was, so if you, you think about it that way, you know, cryptocurrency still has a few more years to see if that killer app will, will finally arrive, but there isn't one today, you know, um, you know, the, the value, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of, there's so much interest, there's so much, uh, there's, there's so many places to go for, for content and for information, you know, uh, you know YouTube, uh, Coinbase, you know, you name it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure every single one of you has some relative who's very into the space. Um, if you do want to do it, Coinbase, or there's even a, there's even a kind of a, a tracking stock you can buy. Uh, called the Grayscale Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two biggies. Uh, the rest of them, I don't know. It, you, you know, you're you know, like like I said. You know, until until there's really some killer apps. I know the with Ethereum, they they they've they started to have a moment in the sun uh, with uh, the uh, NFTs or non fungible tokens, but that that seems to have died out a little bit. Um, you know, if, if you, you know, my, my, the big takeaway, if you're listening to this and, you know, if you're not, if you're afraid of it or you're worried about it, or you, you don't want to do it, don't do it. Just don't, it's not, it's really volatile. Don't, don't, don't take this as me, uh, egging you on to do it. You shouldn't, if you're into it or you want to be a part of it, my, 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 my suggestion is that, you know, you don't, you don't bet more than you can afford to lose, right? You know, treat it like a, you know, treat it, if it's, if it's money that if it all went to zero tomorrow, you wouldn't be uh, heartbroken, then, then that's, then that's the amount of money that you can, uh, then you can put into it because it's, we're, like I said, we're still waiting to see what happens. And, uh, you know, most of you might be a little bit young for this. And while the internet exploded onto the scene in the early nineties, 
there was a big uh, tech bubble burst in the late 90s. And, you know, most of the stocks that had become so valuable from, you know, the early 90s till the late 90s became worthless overnight. And yeah, there were a few keepers, you know, uh, Microsoft and Amazon and eBay are still around and still thriving. But a lot of the companies that were born in the early 90s in the heyday of the internet uh, were are now bankrupt and just distant memories. And so uh, you, you kind of have to imagine that the same the same thing will happen to this space in sooner rather than later. So looks like we've got about five, 10 minutes left. So I will, um, I will stop talking and I'll let anyone that wants to, wants to ask a question can feel free to do so. Um, I have a, I have a question for you, Matt. This is uh, Bethany. Thank you for a presentation that was both demystifying and grounding. Um, and my my curiosity for you is in in the effort to save and to to grow financial wealth through savings. Um, I am aware that the return on investment when you just have a checking or savings account with a institution, a financial institution, is, is pretty low. Um, and so I'm wondering kind of like in the realm of, as you shared with investing in Bitcoin or purchasing stock in Tesla, that is an area that I'll, for myself, I feel um, very overwhelmed and not very knowledgeable in. It wasn't anything that was part of my financial literacy um, within my family or even in my studies. So I'm wondering like what kind of 101, well, first off, is that the way, is that a, 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 a um, a bigger return on investment to slow roll your wealth accumulation over time through investing in bonds and stocks versus just keeping it in the bank. Um, and how do you, how would, what would you suggest as a novice to go about kind of figuring that whole realm of things out? That's a, that's a, that's an excellent question, Bethany. And, and I think even the most sophisticated investors on the planet right now are really struggling with the question of what to do with cash and, I'm gonna to try to I'm gonna to try to paint a picture that isn't too um, that that's that that's accessible. And if I if I fail, just let me know. But the last year and a half have been unlike anything else in history. And the the United States government had a monetary response where the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to zero. And they had a fiscal response where they pumped $5.3 trillion of money into the US economy. And so that, that did two things. It means that there's, there's, <laughs> there's not a CD or savings account or bank account on, in the United States of America that plays, pays you anything more than pennies and nickels. And it means that asset prices across the United States have been pumped up to sky high levels. Stocks, real estate, cryptocurrency, they're all at historically high levels. And I'm not saying that they're gonna go down, but no matter how you cut it, they're all historically high. And so, um, you know, for all of you, the best, the, the best thing you can do is something called, you know, dollar cost averaging, which is a fancy way of putting a little bit of money into the same investment every week, every month, and not worrying about the valuations because they're so unpredictable. And so, um, you know, I'll imagine that as grad students, most of you are probably, you know, you probably skew a little bit younger. And so, you know, you can work with a financial advisor or, or, or if you're into it, you can do your own homework to identify a low cost, diversified, uh, I like exchange traded funds. I think mutual funds are too expensive. They're same thing. One's run by a person, the other's run by a computer. And you just you just put it that same amount, whatever you can budget, right? If it's a hundred bucks a month, you know, if it's a hundred bucks a week, whatever it is, and you just keep you just keep throwing it on the pile and, until until you're 60 and you know you're a millionaire and you're ready to, you know, enjoy. So I I would um I wouldn't, um, you know, for the for the for the saving for the for the emergency fund, 
there's, you know, there, there really isn't any way to generate anything, you know, any, any meaningful return. You just have to kind of stick it in a bank account and forget about it. And it, it just won't be able to work for you the way that savings accounts did in the past. Um, so I hope that, I hope that helped answer your question. Yeah, thank you for pointing out those structural things. <laughs> Any last questions for Matt? No, okay. No, you guys are easy. You take taking it easy on me. Yeah, I don't think there's any more uh, in the chat here, but um, but all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is a really good session. Uh, definitely email me the um, the template, and I will be sure to get it to our attendees. And um, if anybody has any other questions. Um, you know, we'll have, uh, I'm sure Matt, willing, Matt was uh, shared his email there in the presentation. So please feel free to send them along. And uh, we will see you next time at our next event. So thanks All again, right. Matt. Thanks for having me, everyone. Good to see you, Nick. Bye, guys. How do I stop the recording? It's at the bottom. Do you see that button in the middle that says record? Oh, I see it. Yep. Yeah.